If you have your Bibles, open it up to Genesis chapter 1. You have something to write with, get your phones out. If you take notes on your phones, that's great. I love it. You'll probably keep it longer than maybe even a notepad. But mute your phone or silence your phone. We have a lot of uh, God calling into church a lot these days. The phone is ringing a lot. So if the phone does ring in church, that means God is calling and he's approving what Pastor Brent says. So mute your phones, if you will. Guys, we've got a lot of people watching this service. It's absolutely astonishing how many people are watching. Monica, I'm just going to shout out a few because I love our online campus family. We have people watching from everywhere. Monica, Pennsylvania. Chuck and Autumn in Florida. Uh, Love you guys. Go Gators. Uh, Not really. Uh, Kathy, um, Mississippi. Tanya, Minnesota. What's up? John in California. Megan, Kentucky. The Lawsons in Virginia. Renna in South Africa. This service, just to name a few. Give it up for everybody watching everywhere, guys. Love it. Brad Loveday's in the room. Brad, is your birthday today? Is it today? I'm going to pick on you in just a minute then. Give it up for Brad. Who's got a September birthday? Let's see some Septembers. So you're not a a Green Day fan, right? Wake me up when September ends. You like September. Happy birthday to all of our September birthdays. Everybody say happy birthday. birthday. Love you guys. Again, thanks for coming. I'm so proud of you, if that's the right word. Thankful that you're here. Beyond the music, which is stellar, as my boy Scott Self would say. He doesn't say that about himself, but it is stellar. That song was amazing. Give it up for Scott and the band, everybody. How awesome was that? Um, which is so awesome. I mean, Scott was channeling his inner, like, Dave uh, Matthews band and John Mayer there. But the We Are Messenger song is such a powerful song that we're made in God's image. Beyond the sermon, being at church matters to hear the truth. And I'm going to speak the truth to you today, and I want you to submit to that, surrender to that. Be open enough to say, you know what, God, you are God, and I am not And we're in a series, week three, called The Place, The Pit, The Promise. This place in the world, the purpose, the meaning, that is a huge question. And I think the question that a lot of people ask today is, why am I here? And you're like, I don't know, it's church, why am I here? I'm not saying why you're at church, but why are you on the planet? Are you just taking up space on a planet spinning into nowhere? Are you here just to perpetuate the species and die? Are you here to collect stuff? Who's the stuff collector? Let me see some hands if you collect a lot of stuff. Anybody sitting next to somebody that they collect a lot of stuff? Ladies, how many pair of shoes do you need, right? Come on. Am I here just to have a hobby? Anybody sitting next to somebody that's very passionate about a hobby that they have? The old proverbial, the baby diaper on the bass boat. A lot of people ask, you know, what is the meaning of life? You just saw a video that Pastor Mike found from a church that did a man-on-the-street interview. They just shoved a microphone in people's faces and say, hey, what do you think about God? And you saw their responses. I don't don't know. I don't believe. So now you just have no meaning. You just wake up every day talking about feeling insignificant. And it seems like for some reason the culture preaches that at us. Why do you exist? Who are you? You're nobody. One day you'll just be pushing up daisies. And if you think about that as, well, that's the place, that's the world I live in, then you find yourself in a pit, a dark place, a place of insignificance, of no meaning. And forget about any promises that you might have in this life and even the next. You just focus on problems. We all do it. And think of the world in which we live. So my question is, you know, you think about why do you exist? And we went back the last few weeks to the beginning of creation and God created us. We went back to Adam and Eve who never had to ask the question why. God created all things. He created places and spaces for all of us. Human beings are his crowning creation. The Bible does not speak to anything but us being made in his image. So if you think about the majesty of just nature, the mountains, the universe. Do you realize the Bible doesn't speak to that being made in God's image? We look at it that way. Oh, the mountains are awesome. John Denver, y'all remember who remembers John Denver? Rocky Mountain High, high, Colorado. Almost heaven, West Virginia, 
Blue Ridge Mountain, Shenandoah. He was a pantheist. Did you know that? He believed that God was nature. That's what people think. We all look at, I mean, go to the mountains today. Javon and I went Thursday. We went to the mountains. Hadn't done it in a while. Traffic, bumper to bumper in September. I mean, on the mountains, we'd like, well, do we go up to Newfoundland Gap or do we turn right to Cades Cove? Javon was like, well, let's go to Cades Cove. We haven't done that in a while. I'm like, all right, let's do that. So we stopped by the little delicatessen in Gatlinburg. We got our little Reuben sandwich. We turned right at Sugarland Visitor Center. We went to Medcalf Bottoms Picnic Area. We had a great little time, just us and the crows or whatever those blackbirds are that stare at you like, just drop that sandwich. I dare you. <laughs> you know. Then we went to the sinks. Y'all hang out at the sinks because of the hurricane and all the rain. The sinks were blowing. I mean, it was crazy. I'd never seen so much white water. I grabbed my kayak. I flipped down through the upper sinks. I jumped over that. No, woo! People took, no, I didn't. We just took a picture of the water. <laughs> but people are out there. Why? Because we live in a crazy world, and I need a little majesty of creation. I need to go to the mountains and get alone, just me and God and nine million other people. And even then, you know what? You, you go out there for serenity and a little green pasture and a little, I want to be beside still waters. And Javon and I, we left the sinks. We were heading to Cades Cove. And in my mind, I'm thinking it's bumper to bumper here. Wait till we get to Cades Cove. I'm that guy honking my horn at the loop of Cades Cove. Hurry up! And they're like, it's, it's Cades Cove. And we almost hit a car. We rounded a corner and every car had stopped. A motorcycle was coming the other way was looking at the little the, the mountain stream. That's exactly what he did. He veered off on the other lane on his crotch rocket and squared a pickup truck, an F-250. So we got, I got out of the car. It just had happened. Two people were helping him. He had clearly b- broke his left leg. His left his leg was going that way. He's screaming on the ground. I was talking to the couple that the motorcycle hit. His motorcycle is like totally toast. I mean, it is right there. He's laying on the ground. We're stopped both ways. Here's the mountain stream and all that. You hear a guy screaming in agony. And I'm thinking, we can't go anywhere without like trauma anymore. But as amazing as creation is, as amazing as we go to these places, do you realize it's not as amazing as you are according to God's word? You are God's crowning creation. You are made in the image of God. And God is awesome. And Adam and Eve never had to answer the question why. The Bible says, and we looked at it the last few weeks, they walked with God and they talked with God. They laughed with God. You realize God is a God of laughter. I love it. If you don't think God's got a sense of humor, you are living proof that God has a sense of humor. Look around. I always say God has a sense of humor. I just wish he would let me in on the jokes most of the time. So I think we should laugh a little bit. I got got some funny little moments here. My mom doesn't think they're all that funny, but I like them. It's my cheesy sense of humor. God created me. You can't judge me. Has anybody been worried lately? Raise your hands high. You're like, with the state of the world, I'm worried. Hey, don't let worry overwhelm you. Even Moses started as a basket case. Oh, my gosh. I think that's, come on, y'all. I'll be here all week. McKenna, come on. I got to laugh there. How about this? All right, mom gets mad at me, but I like it. Let's stay in the creation theme. Why did God create man before woman? Because he didn't want anyone to give him advice on how to do it. (laughs) The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the earth and he rested. He created man and he rested. He created woman. And since then, neither God nor man has rested. (laughs) Boom. My mom and wife were like, all right, ladies, I'll give this one to you. I'm going to redeem myself right here. We go. Ready? When God finished the creation of Adam, he stepped back, scratched his head and thought, I can do way better than that. (laughs) All right. Come on. Give me there. All right. Lots of love. Lots of love. What's your image of God? That's my question of the day. Big question. What's your image of God? When I ask you, hey, how do you see God? What do you think? Some of you think of Gandalf Grey, the Lord of the Rings. You think some guy with long, gray flowing hair with a flowing beard with a robe up in the universe with the Care Bears, spinning the dials of the planet. 
Maybe you think of Santa Claus. <laughs> God, right? I mean, one of our production team, he was talking to me, emailed me something. He said, it's true. He goes, a lot of people think of God as the big lotto in the sky. We'll call him the, instead of uh, the genie in the bottle, the genie in the Bible. That's good. That's what people think. Maybe he's a Zeus-like character hurling lightning bolts at you when you do wrong. How many times have I heard it? People walk into church, well, I can't come to church. The roof will collapse. I'm like, sure you can, just sit near the wall. <laughs> what is your image of God? That is a great question. A lot of people, man, we, we struggle to think about that. How do we see God is a good, good, good way to put it. How do we see God? And so what I want to do, and it's a little deep, but I want to talk to you about this because I think if we don't watch it, we are guilty of what the, what the culture does. We're guilty of creating an idol that we call God, but we got to remember that God is God and we are not, and we are created in God's image. We don't create God to be in our image, and that is the problem of our society today. And it goes to intellectual theology and emotional theology. Theology is kind of a big word, but it's not. It means the study of God. You're, you're a theologian. You're here, so you're a theologian. You're a studier of God. I want to know God more today than I did yesterday and more tomorrow than I do today. God is all-encompassing. I mean, you think about God. And it's hard sometimes to relate to a God that we do not see, that God is a spiritual being. We are spiritual beings in a physical body. When I say you are made in the image of God, it doesn't mean you look like God. Some of you are like, thank God, right? But it means that we have a heart, we have a soul, we have a mind, we have a will, that we will be held accountable, that God has created us in a way that is different from the rest of creation. I love my dog to death. I love Cash. But Cash does not sit around the house and think of the meaning of dogginess. I tell you, he just looks at me like, give me a treat. He doesn't sit around and wonder if there's a doggy heaven. You're like, do dogs go to heaven? I don't know. I hope. Cash has been annoying me lately. It's time for probably him to move on to heaven. I mean, <laughs> I told Giovanna this the other day, and it's wrong for me to say. It's really a rabbit trail. I said, you know what? wonder if we should just get Cash stuffed. Just send him to the taxi dermy with that little cool look on his face. We can put him in the corner right next to the television, and then I can stare at him and pet him when I want to, put him on the couch, and he won't bark at me every 10 minutes. But I know you love your pet, but we're different than animals. We're God's crowning creation. We have a heart. We have a mind. We have a soul. We know the difference of right and wrong. We have these big questions of life. We understand that. It, I, I think innately we understand that we are spiritual beings in a physical body. If you've never been at the bedside of somebody dying, man, you can see it very clearly that when they die, the life force, their soul, who they are, leaves that physical body. And that body that we have is just a shell. And so intellectually, we know this when we think of God. When I ask you, especially those of us who call ourselves Christians, how do you see God? Intellectually, you, you should and you need to run to God's word. We own and understand. We just sang good, good father. Hey, intellectually, in our hearts and minds, we sit here and go, man, God is good. Can I get an amen? God is merciful. Some of you who jacked up your life, thank God he's merciful. God is forgiving. God is love. All these things that we know. But if I sit there and really probe and I say, you know what? And here's the way I, I worded it. I think this is where people are. How does God feel about you? If I ask you that question, most people will go, I think God's probably disappointed in me most of the time. God's probably saying, hey, Brent, get your act together. Anybody? That, that, I know God's saying that about me. Brent, why are you so discouraged? Why are you so afraid? Intellectually, I know, hey, God, you got me, but I look around the world, I'm like, are you sure you got this, God? Look around. People ask, well, where is God? Why does he not, why does he not care about me? I don't think God is paying attention to me with everybody. And it's a very powerful thing that this world, we talked about Satan's attack last week. Man, if you look around at our world even this week and you think about doubt, discouragement, diversion, defeat, delay, 
There's a systematic attack in our society that will beat us down. The culture will beat us into insignificance and fear. And then we, we look around and we're, wait a minute, how can we sing good, good father? God's perfect in all of his ways. But remember this. In the beginning, God created all things. He created Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve decided to elevate their will above God's will. Even in that, God loves us. He redeemed us. He sent Christ to die on a cross for us. Christ is preparing a place for us today. That's perfect in all God's ways, that he loves his crown and creation that much, that he relentlessly pursues us. Intellectually, we know something, but emotionally, we struggle because we tend to not be able to see God, and that's a struggle in a relationship. And so we have relationships that we see and that we're a part of every day. And we tend to project our relationship that we have with God onto these relationships, these horizontal relationships that we have. And so maybe you have a mother or a father or a teacher or a coach that made an impression on you, good or bad. And you tend to project that relationship you have with God onto how these people of authority have treated you. We have some of you in this room, you had a horrible home life. You have a mom or dad that you didn't think was for you. That they, they screwed up, they did the wrong things and you're like, well, Brent, I, I can't even sing good, good father. I don't even know how to even perceive that. Boy, I didn't have a father ever show me that, so I don't really understand. Intellectually, I can talk to you all day long about how good God is, and you need to hear the truth, but emotionally, you're like, I just don't feel that. Well, sometimes we have to act our way back into a feeling or feel our way into action. Maybe you had a teacher that looked down upon you or a coach will pick on Brad. It's his birthday. My son played junior high basketball for Brad, loved to play for Brad. Brad still coaches, but maybe you had a coach back in the day that you went out for a, a, the team in junior high and Brad was an awful guy and he cut you because you weren't good enough. You're like, no, not in this world, it's upward, we all win. <laughs> but that's life, right? But yet some of you, you're like, well, maybe I, I look at God and I don't really measure up, I don't. Man, I, I, I screw, I guess I'm not good enough. And people feel that way every day. And the reason is, I think we've created God in our image. We tend to put God in a box. And we forgot that we were created in his image. We know this, Genesis chapter 1, the first book of the Bible, the first chapter says this. God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness. People get tripped up on this verse. What do you mean our? How many gods are there? We see the Trinity pop off the page. Chapter 1, book 1. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're created in God's likeness. So we may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and over the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. We're created in God's image. And so I'm going to ask you this question and I put it this way, do you imagine God in a way that expresses your interest and your needs? If you're a judgmental person, you might see God as the great judge of all. If you're, if you're hyped up on peace, you see God as a God of peace overall. If it's love everybody, then God is, of course, a God of love, and that's where he should stay. What is your image of God? So I thought, how do I uh, bring this to life? I'm going to go back to an illustration that I've used in years gone by in different ways, never really used it this way. And I want you to look at it this way because I think this is the problem of our society today. I really do since this is where we're at. There's God and there's us. I've used this a couple of different ways and illustrations. The first time I ever used it was years ago. I used it with tithing, and I had a few dollar bills inside here, and I would throw a few dollars into the God box, and, and I would say, well, God, you know, I understand that I'm supposed to bring back what you have given me, but this is what I have, and this is what I'll, I'll give you a little bit, but instead we need to realize when we put Christ in the center of our finances, when it becomes... Less of us and more of God. We used the verse last few weeks. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
One time I used it about just relationships. Well, God, and I had a Barbie doll in here, and I threw a Barbie in the God box. Well, God, I'll give you that relationship, and God, I'll give you this. And I had a bunch of junk under, under and I shook it, and I said, God, I might even give you the junk in my life, but I'm not going to give you me. I want to control me, and I think that was a great illustration. But for today's purposes, I want you to look at this God box, and Baylor University did a study. It wasn't that long ago that they asked Americans, they surveyed us and said, hey, how do you see God? And it's interesting that Baylor would have found that Americans tend to put God in four distinct boxes. We like to put God in his little spot. We like to say, God, you know what? We want to do what we want to do, and you fit in your little spot. So here's what they found out. Baylor, secular study. Number one, authoritarian. A lot of people look look at God as authoritarian. If you don't know what that definition means, we'll get there in a minute. And boy, it is apropos for today. I'll give you a picture. Um, Teenagers Wednesday night, they got a kick out of this. They all applauded, right? This is parents. Strict enforcement of obedience. Basically, do as I say. Not, Not as I do. Do as I say. Right? And what authoritarian means? Enforcing strict obedience to authority, especially that of government, at the expense of personal freedom. Does that sound like us today? Right? People would say, God, if you really put God in a box where God should live, is benevolent, love, kind. Actually, had somebody say this to us as a staff this last, within the last two weeks. The church. In America today, our church and our community should only be a benevolent organization. We have no right to talk about lifestyle, to talk about surrendering our lives to God's word. That's us up to individuals. We as a church should only exist to help people. That's it. So we're to make the world a better place to go to hell from is what we're, we're to do. That's wrong, but that's how people look. God, you're a love. Hey, you love me. I do what I want. You're supposed to love me. That's a little how a lot of people look. Distant is another word. Four categories, God is distant. Tweaking the dials of the universe. He is not, and I love this picture. We put this picture because I think a lot of people feel that way. When you're through a crisis and you're sitting alone and you're isolated, God feels 10 million miles away. But when you read the Gospels, Emmanuel, Jesus, God with skin on, would come to the earth and he would teach and preach to us and show us that God is not a distant God. He became close that we might have a relationship and we are to call God our heavenly father. That's how close and intimate of a relationship that God wants with us. His crowning creation. But a lot of people would feel that way. Well, God, you're just 10 million miles. You live in a galaxy far, far away. That's how people feel. The last one is critical. God is God of judgment. And he is that. But that's how people, well, when I think of God, and that's why we're pushing back. That's why it's a society that's really spiritually gone down a crazy train of depravity Now look at God and go, well, I don't know what I, whatever I believe today, I believe today. And people, I'm telling you, are lost. How's it working? I mean, we live in a biggest, anxious, crazy, depressed, overwhelmed, fearful, you name it. We can throw every word out there, especially the last two years. And it seems like we've been rolling this direction for a long time. God, stay out of my business. That critical idea of love with parameters God, you should never put any parameter or standard on me. That's not what it's about. But a parent that loves a child understands love has parameters. It is not you do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. That is not real love. But that's how people look. We tend to put God in a box. And this statement is powerful to me. The way we see God determines how we relate to God. And the way we relate to him is an essential factor in how we live out our life by faith. So I'm going to ask you, do you put God in a box? For us, this is the problem. This is a visual problem of our society because today we have a God-like complex and all of us, we want to, hey, God, you fit into our lives and our lifestyles and what we want. And if you don't fit, which is not going to, then I don't know if I believe you anymore. We do not like the teaching of it's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. We do not like that. God is the genie in the Bible, the get out of hell free card, the Santa Claus. 
No, God is a God who loves you, who created you, who redeemed you, who longs for a relationship with you and wants you to not elevate your will above his will. We worship God by giving God our lives. And man, that's not taught. Today, it's the distance. However we want to fit God in our lives, we do it. But that doesn't work that way. God is God. Listen to me closely. And we are not God. We are to be like God, but we are not God. And that's the problem in our world today. So what I want to do is give you a little ammunition. I want you to understand that the Bible has so much to say about who God is. There are lots of depictions of God, and it's really hard to see that total picture. You can't just put God in a box in a nice little neat package as we would want to do. But God is so encompassing in our lives, and there's so much goodness. And you can even Google it. Hey, what does the Bible say about who God is? And hundreds of verses will come up. And to listen to who God is, and just especially in the light of the world that we live in, is something I want, I want to take you into my personal devotional life, which I rarely do. But this last couple of months, especially with the Delta variant and everything that's kind of transpiring in our world, and for me as a pastor, thinking, man, spiritual rhythm is so important. And some things that I've been struggling with. And I feel maybe that God is distant and what is going on. And so I've been going back to the basics in my life, in my heart, going back to God's word. So number one, I've been focusing on this. God, you are light and salvation. Psalms 27 says this, the Lord is my light. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In the darkest hours of my life, and boy, those dark hours come, you know, it's easy to kind of, my, my wife will tell you, man, it's easy to get overwhelmed, but I go back to God, you're my light, you're my salvation, you're the stronghold of my faith. Why am I so afraid? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters, besides green pastures. He restores my soul. The Bible says that God is our guide, he is our shepherd. So if God is the shepherd, yes, people, we are sheep. I've said it before, I'll say it again. One of my favorite things that people make fun of me, but I love it, right? Sheep are dumb sometimes. If one sheep does it, we all do it. One sheep jumps off a cliff, ah, we all go, okay, ah, ah, we all jump. Look around, that's what we do. I like what my life application Bible says. Rebelling against the shepherd's way is actually rebelling against our own interest. We don't understand the more we surrender to God and lock in on he as a shepherd guiding and directing us. And the Bible says what? A shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. That's how much he loves us. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know that, Psalm 23. Rock and stronghold reoccurring theme for me. Truly, God is my rock, my salvation. He's my fortress. I will never be shaken. Truly, God is my rock, my salvation, my fortress. I will never be shaken. It's so easy to be shaken today. It seems like the world is shaking around us. God, you're my rock. You're my salvation. Love. God is a God of love. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in Jesus will not perish but have an eternal place that is being prepared for you and for me today. That's amazing. A couple of things I want you to do. And I'm gonna jump on a soapbox for a minute. Spend some time this week, challenge yourself to jump into God's word and see what the Bible has to say about who God is. I don't, under, I don't understand why this church, every church in America is not completely packed on a weekly basis. Not now, not in the world in which we live. I can't believe that we don't run to God's word. I feel like as a child, I don't know how to say this, but I feel like us as a church, people that I, I'm kind of responsible for and shepherd, I can feel a spiritual daze. People are just lost. We don't spend time in God's word. You can feel it. We spend time on social media. We scroll Facebook. We're on the news. We do whatever. We jump to the mountains. We roll to everything to distract us. But what matters the most, who God is and what he has done for us and how good he is and an eternity that is set when the temporary trials and tribulations of this world will come and go, eternity is a long time. I can't, I don't understand other than there's a systematic evil in the world that is creating so much destruction, division, doubt, delay. 
I mean, spend some time this week. Challenge yourself. Go to God's Word. But the, the big one I want you to hear the truth and let's respond to this is don't make the mistake of fashioning God in your image. Remember, you were made in His image. Don't try to put God into your life. Spend time this week at home, alone, wherever. God, I surrender my life to you. I'll close with this. My son is 18. I mentioned him a while ago. My daughter is 26. The older I get, the more I see it. Boy, do my kids imitate my wife and I. They are us made over. All these awesome characteristics they have come from me. All these stubborn characteristics come from Giovanna. But they're us. I can't believe how much they imitate us. It's amazing. Sometimes I get so perturbed at them both, and Giovanna's like, they're just being you. <laughs> Shut up, Giovanna. Right? I went to the dermatologist last week. My wife, she loves, I love how she makes appointments for me to get a colonoscopy, and the dermatologist. <laughs> She sits there. She doesn't make appointments for herself. She just goes and holds my hand as two female doctors walk in there and I have to strip down to my underwear and they check me from head to toe. They found one spot and they froze it. She checked my bald head. She pulled my head down. She goes, man, you, you got pretty good skin for an old guy. You must be wearing a hat. Thanks. And I look at myself in the mirror. I'm like, man, I am like my dad. I look like my dad. My, I look like my papa. He had more hair than me at 70. And it's amazing how we imitate. And I thought of school and how we go back to school, junior high and high school, and how we imitate and we image people around us. That, that's the right word, image. I remember I was a freshman in high school in 1985, the middle of the 80s, had my perm, mullet. I was looking tight. Had my pleated pants with a button and you unbutton it and it was a different color down the pleat. Oh, I wore my mauve shirt. It was pink, but it was mauve in the 80s. And I walked into day one of school and I had this shirt on and I thought it was a designer shirt. And I looked around and all my friends had their Izod shirts on with a little, little Izod, little, little gator. And I looked down and my shirt had a fox on it. <laughs> my mom went to J.C. Penney and got the Izod off brand in the 80s. Don't you judge me, ladies, with your Jordass jeans back in the day. So my friend, Richie Kelly, I'll never forget it. He's a freshman, walks up. He's like, what, what kind of shirt do you have on? I'm like, what do you mean? I had my perm, my pleated pants, my pink shirt. He's like, what is that? Is that a, is that a, is that a fox? All of us got on our Izod shirts. For a year, I was called Foxy. For a year. You know what happened, right? I wanted to imitate my friends so bad. I went home, I said, Mom, you embarrassed me. She went to the store, got me two Izod shirts, two. She said, Brent, they're a lot of money. I wore the same two shirts for a year, every other day. Never wear that off J.C. Prenny, off brand of Foxy again. Man, that was trauma. If you're athletes in high school, you hang with athletes. If you're band people, you hang with band people. If you're in the choir, you're this, you're that. It's amazing how we imitate our peer groups. Today we struggle. If we don't really feel significant, we run to different identities. We're, we're a culture that imitate, but it has an ancient pattern. You know that, right? It goes back to the Garden of Eden. It goes back to you and I were made to mirror the majesty of our maker. And yet we've put every other substitute but God in the place to imitate an image. We are imaging people. We imitate. Spend some more time imitating the image of God. God, you're God and I am not. You are a good, good father. You are perfect in all of your ways. Allow me to see that and not just run down the cultural stream with everyone else who is looking for meaning and significance. You are created in God's image. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God loves you more than you love yourself, but God is God and you are not. Remember that. We need to. The message was entitled Refining Our Image of God, not Redefining Our Image of God. That's the problem. Refine our image of God. God, thank you for all that you've done and who you are. 
God, thank you for us having an opportunity to be here today. Thank you for these moments that matter. I just believe all of us need this message. We live in a culture that we long for meaning and significance. We imitate. We roll down just peer pressure groups and this is what the culture says to do, so we do it. God, allow us to understand that following Jesus Christ is very countercultural. We walk toward Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Thank you that you created me, you created us. Thank you that you've made a way for us, even though that sin has come into our lives and we can easily elevate our own will above your will. God, as we surrender to you, it's not what we've done, it's who we are, it's whose we are. We're, we're, we're your child and you love us. You long for us to follow your will and your way as a shepherd longs for the sheep to follow. God, thank you that you've prepared a place for us. And over the next few weeks, as we talk about eternity, we talk about a place, a real place called heaven and a real place called hell. God, allow us to once again recommit our lives to you, to the truth, and let the truth set us free. I'm grateful that even sometimes we don't feel like it, May we sing this song to you, act our way back into a feeling, be obedient children, and just sing how good of a father that you are, grateful for all that you've done in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.